Good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight for this uh, candidate forum for Rutland City School Board. My name is Jim Sabat Hasso. I'm news editor of the Rutland Herald, and I'll be serving as tonight's moderator. Very pleased to be part of this community forum tonight, held in partnership with our friends here at PEG TV. As moderator, I'll be asking questions of the candidates over the next 60 minutes or so. Uh, the questions are generated by Herald editors and have not been seen by the candidates in advance. Candidates will have two minutes each to answer. This town meeting day, city voters will be choosing from a field of four candidates to fill three three-year seats on the Board of School Commissioners. Now I'd like to introduce our candidates here tonight, Justine Franco and Jen Hondnoni. Incumbent Commissioner Stephanie Studley could not attend tonight due to illness, and Charlene Seward, the other incumbent on the ballot, declined to participate could decline to participate in tonight's forum. No one is running, meanwhile, for a single two-year seat left vacant by the outgoing com commissioner, Kevin Kefaber. Um, with so few candidates here in attendance tonight, we may not make the full hour, but uh, we'll ask some questions and we'll uh, get to know the two candidates who could attend tonight. And uh, let's start with introductions. Uh, Justine, Jen, thank you for both for being here tonight. Um, I give you each two minutes to introduce yourselves Share with us your experience and tell us a little bit of why you want to be school commissioner. And we'll go in alphabetical order and then just kind of go back and forth through the night. Uh, we'll start with you, Justine. Okay. Well, thank you, Jim. Thank you, PEG TV, for inviting us and allowing us to talk about ourselves and explore what it will be like to be on the Rutland City School Board, should that be my destiny. Um, well, I'm actually here today because of a decision that was made by a, a city school board when I was 15 years old. Um, I was at a point in my life where I was um, disengaged from school, I was not motivated, and I was counting the days until I turned 16 so that I could maybe find another thing to do. Um, so we ended up, my family and I decided that I might go to the technical center, which didn't actually work out so well because well, I had blue hair, and at the time, blue hair was a little bit different, so I had some bullying situations going on. But what we ended up doing is we went to the um, school board and the superintendent, and we asked for some guidance and to figure out what the solution would be. What we ended up doing is um, going to a neighboring school, and that situation changed my entire life and brought me here today. And I think, am I out of time? Is that? Um, you have more time if you like. Maybe oh, okay. Time. So um, that other school that I went to, um, that other school that I went to allowed me to further my education. I ended up going to college. I ended up um, going to graduate school. I became a nurse practitioner, which is why I came here to Rutland and um, ended up working for the school department as well as the COVID coordinator and the, a high school nurse. By the time I was leaving and moving on to the hospital, I decided that I wanted to still be a part of the school department, and what a better way than to be on the school board. Thank you. Thanks. Jen. Uh, hi, thank you so much for uh, having us here this evening. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak and um, let everybody know why I'm doing this. I'm a mom of four, and uh, two of which are uh, here in school. I have a sixth grader and a first grader. And we moved here about six years ago from Southern California. I struggled out there to find schools that were adequate, I felt were good for my children. I was born and raised in New Hampshire, so I knew the quality of the schools up here in New England. So um, it was a perfect opportunity to move here. My, I had a 14 year old at the time who is, I was, entering high school. So she went through Rutland High School and the Stafford Technical Center and I have nothing but wonderful things to say about them. So that brings me here tonight and I am ready to become more actively involved in the community and within the school system and hopefully this will be my destiny as well. Thank you. Thank you. All right, candidates, mm -hmm. thanks a lot. Uh, now for our first question. Uh, you each have two minutes to answer. Uh, first question tonight, what do you see as the major challenge or challenges facing city schools right now? And we'll go back to you, Justine. I think when I worked for the school department, one of the biggest challenges I saw is the um, lack of motivation from the students. And I'd like to attribute that to what happened during COVID and the lockdown. Uh, but 
I think that that was maybe a, a tide that was kind of rolling in and um, starting to occur before COVID did. Uh, this is a really big problem that you have kids that are not wanting to remain in the classroom for whatever reason. There's, a, there's such a large group of kids that are um, needing help uh, emotionally and they need to feel more engaged. Um, this then affects the teachers in these school departments and school systems. They're, it's very difficult to retain good teachers and it's also difficult to bring teachers into the school system to work. So it's a, it's a really big challenge. Um, I think that's one of the biggest things that the school department is facing right now. Um, yeah, um, I think that one of the major issues from what I see and from people that I talk to, it generally comes down to staffing and having the adequate staff, having enough counselors uh, to appropriately care for the students and having enough paraeducators that the students that need help can get it and it can provide for a better educational experience for all of the children. Yeah. Um. Let's pick up on something both of you had kind of alluded to um, and talk a little bit about um, post-pandemic learning. Several years out, we're still seeing the negative impacts of the pandemic in both student mental health and academic outcomes. What more do you think schools could do to help students recover? And back to Justine. Um, I, well, you know, I think it's, it's a matter of engaging students. Um, meeting them where they're at and it's a cliche but i feel like there's something really to that and we can see that at the allen street campus where um, it's led by scott corbett who has found this way to to bring these kids out of their out of their element that they're in and and just raise them to a higher level he's using a lot of like physicality he's um engaging them in composting or um, there's a skate park he takes them skiing so he's he's making their learning physical which we know we know there's research that when you make learning physical it it is retained and um, so he's, he's touching on something that I think that we could maybe be doing in the school system in general. I don't think it just needs to be at Allen Street Campus or Grove Street Campus or Pierpoint, which it, it should be something that maybe we bring in. Um, I don't necessarily think it's more physical fitness per se in a traditional level, but it's kind of changing learning. I, I, I have the sense that learning is still kind of back in the 20th century um, and we need to bring we there's so much research on learning and education but our schools currently right now are not utilizing that and they're needing to um, just step up the game and I think bringing in new teachers as well would um, would kind of bring in some a, a new focus and bring in some some spirited learning thank you Jen um, I, yeah not to um, you know mimic Justine yeah, here. That's okay. I don't know. Um, it. No, it's true. We need to meet the children where they are um, and they're at all different levels and the pandemic affected every family differently and every child differently and they all need different approaches and I think that um, with more physicality, with more uh, counselors, with more paraeducators, I think that we could meet the needs of those children better. Sure. Thank you. Um, and picking up off some of that, uh, violent student behavior and bullying continues to be an issue locally as well as across the country in schools. Um, what additional steps beyond existing policies do you think the district could take to protect students? Do you want to go first? Because <laughs> sure. I feel like, okay. Good. Um, all right, so what additional steps could they take to stop bullying? Um, you know, I know that it's really, really hard when children are dealing with things at home and then they bring that trauma into the school and bullying uh, in a lot of times is acting out. So I think, again, if we can reach those students and find out what's going on in their lives and meet their needs and hopefully get them to a better place, that hopefully will help reduce some of that. Yeah, I think that's a great point that Jen just brought up because if we're looking at 
at wh where this bullying is coming from. And of course, in my opening statement, I talked about being bullied for having blue hair. Now kids aren't being blue bullied for having blue hair, but, um, but for all different reasons. And, but really, if I think about it, it there's, there's something deeper going on here. These, we have a lot of kids that are unhoused or they have housing insecurity or they have um, health insecurities. And it feels like we need to, as a city, be addressing those deeper issues. Now, can the school do that? The school can absolutely be a part of that. Um, but I think it's a, it's a much bigger problem that we need to get to the root of, and then we might see some changes. Um, it, but it's a, it's a very difficult question, and it's, it's age old. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, within school districts, uh, this is the next question. Uh, there's often a tension between maintaining uh, confidentiality among students, accountability, transparency. Um, this can also result in greater community becoming frustrated uh, in the ways in which information about incidents regarding student safety are communicated. What should the district be doing to be more transparent with and accountable to the community? Oh, I can. Yeah. Uh, I would love to see some kind of a report that's put out regularly by the schools that details maybe the number of encounters and the type of encounters. Very, very sanitized version, not um, risking anybody's um, identity. You know, there would be no private information, of course. It would have to protect privacy above all. But just to understand what type of encounters are occurring at the schools. Are we having, you know, and, and maybe so that we can react and help. Like say if they're having, you know, 35 encounters in a month with children, you know, vaping. You know, maybe that's the point where, okay, well, let's reach out to the health department and have them go and give a talk at the school about vaping and the dangers of vaping. Or if the greater public understands, you know, hey, we're having a lot of student-on-student -student encounters at this school, you know, maybe they can look at it and say, oh, hey, well, we want to send more counselors over there or more educators or whatever it may need. Yeah, I think that's, it's a really great point. It's it feels like we need the parents to be more involved. And in having worked for the school department, and I'll go back to the COVID coordinator, I saw how the inner workings were within each school and the admit between the administration and the staff and the families. I, I saw this at play all the time. And um, being in healthcare, I know that there's a, through, we have HIPAA and FERPA and we have all these um, acts that protect students. But, but I do believe that we need to, if the parents are saying that they are feeling that they're not involved and not notified and feeling, if they're feeling like they're on the outside, then they are on the outside. And there's got to be a way to bring it together. Um, I really like Jen's idea about some sort of like monthly um, correspondence that is sanitized. Um, that might be a great idea, There's, but there has to be more communication. I would like to see more parents come to the table to tell us how they want to be communicated with and how they feel um, would be the best way to kind of bridge this gap. Yeah, um, you mentioned parent involvement, uh, so I asked this one. Uh, what role do you think parents should play in decisions about the school district? Uh, I'll go. Um, I. I feel that it, there should be parent involvement um, on the board. Um, there should be a, maybe a subcommittee of parents that um, are very vocal and kind of field questions themselves. And I, they should be understanding why it is that, why it is that the administration is, mm, challenged in giving them information, but they should also tell the administration what it is that they should be doing to help out and um, increase communication. Um, ideally, I think all parents should be involved in their children's education. Obviously, that can't always happen for whatever reason, but I would want to see maximum parent involvement um, when they can. and. A lot of that involves to the communication from the school and knowing when and where the parents can be involved and can um, be a part of their child's education. Also, um, things like Justine said, being on the board and other committees and other ways that they can help out. I think all of that's incredibly important. 
Um, <clears throat> I think, Justine, you had mentioned um, you know, how in a lot of ways we're still kind of working off a 20, 20th century model in the classroom. Um, so I'll ask you about a bill that's currently uh, sitting in the Vermont Senate uh, that would require pre-K to 12 students to leave their personal electronic devices at home or surrender them upon arrival at school. Um, it would also give them the choice to opt out of the use of electronic devices or online products in the classroom, and it would prohibit schools from using social media to communicate with students or families. What's your opinion on this bill, um, and what, is your, what are your thoughts on the presence of digital devices, platforms, products uh, in the schools? Um, I, I think that, that social media and digital devices can be a wonderful tool for education. Um, I also think that it is, um, from a wellness perspective, I feel that it is dumbing us down. Um, you, <laughs> I think about the fact that I could remember 20 phone numbers 10 years ago, and now I can remember three, if I'm lucky. Um, and those were numbers from 20 years ago. So I, we can't deny that, that these devices are, um, I think they are crippling our children. And I have myself been lecturing in classrooms and kids are on their phones. And if I go up to kind of gently take the phone away, they, you know, I had one child slap my hand, um, which was, <laughs> hmm, okay. I won't touch your phone, but please don't touch me either. Um, so there's, there seems to be a very strong dependence on these devices in school for kids. Um, yet, I do feel that it's a wonderful way to communicate with families because everybody does have this computer um, in their hand, in their pocket. So it's, it's a good way to get the word out to families when there's a snowstorm, when there's this happening, when there's other things that are occurring that um, need to be addressed. But um, so it's it's not black or white. There's just a lot of gray, and I think that um, we would need to really break down what what we take from that. Um, it's not to be taken lightly, but I think it's very much something that we should be looking at. Thank you, Jen. Um, I absolutely agree that children should not be on phones in the classroom. Um, I think that's an easy one. However, I think it's a bit of overreach to tell children that they cannot bring a phone to school. As a single mom, that's the only way I have to communicate with my child when she's not with me. And if something happens and I can't be at home and she has no way of getting hold of me, it, she could be very upset. Um, so I don't think that they should be able to ban them entirely. I, every classroom my daughter's ever been in, she's been made to keep her phone, uh, say, outside in her locker or away from her so that it can't be a distraction. And I think that that's just fine, but I think um, it's a bit of overreach to tell parents that their child can't have a, a device at all in, at the school. Um, and as far as the schools not being on social media, uh, I don't think that's, I mean, right now I know that they ask if they can have permission to post pictures. And so if you don't want your child's picture on there, you can opt out of that. But I think it is a great tool for getting information out to parents quickly and efficiently. So the idea of telling schools that they cannot be on social media at all, again, I feel is a bit of overreach. Thank you. Um, let's talk budget. Uh, what are your thoughts on the proposed budget for the district? As a board member, uh, where would you look to make cuts? Conversely, are there any areas you would not consider cutting or where you'd like to spend more money or you think more money should be spent? Um, yeah. yeah, I. I've, looked at the budget and the, the per student spending and I feel like it's pretty in line with last year and I would be okay approving that. Um, as far as cuts or um, adding, I don't think that there's much that I would cut out of what we have currently. Um, as far as adding, it would be up to, you know, the first thing to be would be to ask, you know, and find out what the educators, what the schools need the most and uh, go from there. Yeah, I, I, Ted Plamenos is an expert at budgets, and um, I think he's done a really great job over the past several years. So I would say at this point, um, I would support that budget, but I also would be interested in hearing what other people feel about that budget and do they feel that they need more, um, and then maybe open up that discussion. 
Um, moving on, uh, what would you say is the best way to address differences of opinion on the board between board members or between the board and the administration? Shall I go? Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> I, I feel like having very caring and compassionate and open discussions is important. Um, I certainly understand that they can get spirited. I can get spirited too in my discussions. But I think at the end of the day, it's neighbor to neighbor. We are all doing the work for the kids and the school department. And we, are, we just want the best for Rutland in general. Um, so kind of bringing down the level of contention and um, anger um, is something that I think we want to keep in line with. Um, I feel that the board has, has reached a nice plateau where people are kind and considerate, um, and I think that that should just continue. Um, yeah, totally. I agree with uh, Justine that you know we need to have open, honest communication and respect for each other. And it's okay to disagree. It's good to disagree. It's good to have discussion and to feed off of each other and to try to get to a good place in um, in a compromise. And uh, so I would come at it from that angle. As far as between, if it was a dispute between the board and you know some administration or a school system, I think that without knowing what that dispute could possibly be, it'd be hard to say exactly how I might handle that in the situation, but I think that whatever is done, we would have to act together as a board. Thank you. Um, you know, going off of that, uh, could you support a board decision you did not vote in favor of? Why or why not? I, can, I would, yes. Um, you know, Part of being on a board is the fact that you have to compromise and you have to work together and um, so yeah even if it was you know 10 to 1 and I was the one on the other side then yes I would go along with it absolutely yeah yeah I, I have encountered this on boards I've been on and um, it, you um, you state your case you can argue your point you can give your opinion but at the end of the day it's it's a board together and it's based on a vote and yes so I would support something that I didn't agree with. Um, next question. Uh, what role, if any, do you think the school board should play in shaping curriculum? I don't believe they should have a large role at all. I think that that should be left up to the educators and the people who have trained and gone to school and learn how to do that and do it for a living. Yeah. I, I, completely agree. That's their expertise. They are experts in their field and we have we hire them and so therefore we have faith that they are going to do that job and do it well. Um, we are rolling right through questions with just the, the two of you here. Um, I think I might have one more just to kind of have you um, sort of summarize some things here. Uh, is there a particular issue that has motivated you to serve on the board? Do it. Oh, um, <laughs> to serve on the board, maybe not specifically, but um, you know, there I did have an issue with my daughter being um, harassed, and I won't go into the details. Anybody that wants to see it can look at the meetings from last year. Um, so it's what got me initially more interested in learning more about the system um, and the school system and it made me want to become more actively involved and hopefully make a positive change. Um, I feel like as a um, high school nurse, I, I worked with a lot of kids that were coming into my office that were needing so much more than just um, something to heal a wound or um, a burn or something. Did so much of what was walking into my office was a, of, of psychosocial nature. And um, I knew that when I was transitioning from Rutland City Public Schools to um, Rutland Regional Medical Center, that I wanted to be a part of the students' lives and, and help them kind of get through this very, very difficult time in their lives and the, help them with their struggles and, and try to help the community 
to help these kids because it's just it's so important these children are our future they are the and we want them to go out and be the best citizens that they can be and they like I had that leg up um, from my school board when I was 15 years old I would really not be here today if it weren't for that decision I was planning on leaving school and I don't know what I would have done but I wouldn't be here um, so yeah, when I was making that transition, I knew that I wanted to be on the school board. I said, this is, I can't just leave. And um, so when the, the opportunity came, um, I was very motivated and feel very, very motivated to be a part of um, Rutland City Public Schools. Thank you. Um, well, that marks the end of our questions. Uh, I now invite both of you to make some closing remarks. Uh, we have time, so take as much time as you like. There is little. Um, and we'll go ahead. Jen, do you want to start? Um, sure. Uh, so I did tell a little bit about myself at the beginning. And um, apologies. So I'm really excited to hopefully be able to do this and hopefully serve our community and become more involved. And I am really on board. I want to promote safety and foster growth and exploration and amplify student voices. And um, I hope you'll go out and vote on March 5th. I also encourage you to vote on March 5th. Please, yes, this is so important. We need to make citizens of the world. And um, I especially want to say that um, my daughter, in watching me come up here, I hope that I motivate her to become a citizen of the world too. Um, She's very excited. She's six years old and she's very excited that I'm running for school board. So I want to make her proud. So yes, go vote. <laughs> May I also say thank you, Peg TV and Rutland Herald for putting this together tonight. Thank you very much for having us. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you to the candidates, Justine Franco, Jen Randononi. Um, also on the ballot this year is going to be Stephanie Sudley and Charlene Seward. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time to be here tonight uh, so the voters can get to know you, better learn about where you stand on the issues. Uh, so thank you for that. Yeah. Special thank you too to our partners at PEG TV for recording and rebroadcasting this discussion between now and town meeting day on March 5th. Uh, please exercise your right to vote. I'd also like to invite you to join us back here next Wednesday at 6 p.m. for our Board of Aldermen Candidate Forum moderated by Tom Donahue. I'm Jim Sabatasso for the Rutland Herald and PEG TV. Thank you and good night. <laughs>